The expanse is enormous. Half of the territory of the United States lies below it. At the turn of the 20th century, a trip across the Atlantic took a week, maybe more. And hidden in this vast world, to anyone who dared cross it, were hazards, both natural and man-made. Enemy ships, and soon, submarines. In those early years of the century, two brothers in San Francisco and a designer in Santa Ana, California, came upon an idea that the new flying machines, created just a few years earlier, could in time be used to conquer the seas. And eventually, one aircraft would become the lasting symbol of maritime patrol. In 1912, Glenn Martin flew his self-built biplane across the waters between Catalina Island and Newport Bay. At the same time, in San Francisco, Allen and Malcolm Lockheed were working on their own seaplane, the first ever biplane with a front-mounted engine. In 1913, the Model G flew from the Golden Gate entrance across the waters of San Francisco Bay. Soon, competing businesses emerged, the Lockheed Aircraft Company and the Glen L. Martin Company. They had no idea what seed they were planting with regards to using this technology to not only traverse great expanses of water, but also be able to explore those great areas of water. Planting the seed. Over the next four decades, both companies would develop planes with technologies and capabilities that would later become key elements of maritime patrol aircraft. The Martin portfolio included historic giants such as the P-3M, the Mariner, the Mars seaplane, and the Marlin. Lockheed built venerable aeronautics icons, including the Hudson, Ventura, and the Harpoon. As the Cold War heated up, so did the threats. The U.S. and its allies feared a Soviet nuclear strike executed by a submarine. New threat required new technology. The result? Anti-submarine warfare, or ASW. The problem was the submarine was becoming such a strategic element in the enemy's arsenal. And Russia had uh, a tremendous number of submarines and increasing in capability every year. New requirements pitted the Martin and Lockheed companies head to head battling for the U.S. Navy contract for a new cutting edge ASW aircraft. The Martin Mercator and Lockheed Neptune were the answers. The Neptune, smaller, less expensive, and more capable, won the bid. Over the next decade and a half, it would be fitted with the best surveillance tools, including sauna buoys, magnetic anomaly detectors, and a belly-mounted surface search radar. But by the late 1950s, even the Neptune wasn't enough to keep pace with the growing submarine threat. Neptune had seen uh, its limits on the capabilities that were needed with the advances of submarine they needed an aircraft that could have a longer endurance, greater range, and longer on station time with better weaponry. In 1957, development began. Lockheed Corporation chose to work off the design of its L-188 Electra. And it turned out that by doing some modifications to the Lockheed Commercial Electra airline, uh, Lockheed was able to come up with solution that was very satisfactory to the Navy for their next generation maritime patrol aircraft. Everything that had been learned before about maritime patrol, about range and capability, about anti-submarine warfare, about electronic surveillance, it all came together in a single plane. The 
Lockheed P-3 Orion. The P-3 was, without question, on day one, was the most advanced maritime patrol airplane in the world. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. This new plane quickly gained international attention, flying blockade patrols during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Because of the publicity that came with the Cuban Missile Crisis, the P-3 Orion became a household name. Later that decade, it took on a variety of missions during the Vietnam War. And during the 60s, international operators got on board. The aircraft's capabilities continued to grow, too. First, the P-3A, then the P-3B, and by 1969, the P-3C was in service. The difference between the P-3B, which was the best thing available, and the P-3C was a conversion from analog technology to digital technology. It was a eureka moment when we started to realize what this was doing for us. In the 1970s, three more international operators. Meanwhile, the world was changing, and so was the P-3. Once just a subhunter, it shined in new roles, fighting forest fires, tracking down drug runners, or watching over fishery and wildlife areas. So again, just a testament to its uh, versatility of the design and capability of this aircraft. In the 1980s, Japan and Portugal became operators, and the P-3C Update 3 made its debut. By this time, the P-3 had become the go-to plane for U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Meanwhile, NASA, along with NOAA, started using it for weather research. And in the early 90s, at the onset of the Iraq conflict, U.S. Navy P-3s were the first American forces to arrive in the area. That decade, five more countries became P-3 operators. In 1995, those two companies that had once locked horns for the P-3 contract merged. Ironically, at the same time, the last P-3 rolled off the production line. It all came to an end for me when I gave the farewell speech at the delivery of the last P-3C to the United States Navy. I think it was a melancholy moment for everybody when the P-3C production finally came to an end. Although production stopped, New technology ensured that global P-3 operators could add at least two more decades to fleet life. The first wing is now in production on Orion Way. In 2008, the P-3 Midlife Upgrade Program, adding even more life to this critical aircraft. The 21st century also saw three more countries join the P-3 family as Orion operators. Now, in 2012, the P-3 marks its 50th year in service. Those who were there in the early days say they had a feeling, even back then, that what they were working on would stand the test of time. They were reliable, uh, they were maintainable by the fleet, and uh, so it doesn't surprise me, and I'm sure a lot of other people, that the airplanes are still flying all around the world. Oh, I'm, I'm very proud of it. I follow uh, everything I can get my hands on. Today, these aircraft have been upgraded with new wings, new tails, and zeroed flight time. So now, it's, another, it's a brand new airplane ready for another couple of decades of service to the country. Oh, that airplane's going to be around, uh, what, this 2012? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised it's still around 2030. From the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, all the way to the current conflicts in the Middle East, 
the P3 has and continues to be a key asset in gathering intelligence. Every day, in all parts of the world, it guards coastlines, fights against piracy, intercepts drugs, and of course, as always, out there over the vast ocean, the first line of defense against enemy intruders and submarines.